Hello everybody and welcome to our next video that's going to talk about issues related to vapor pressure. So what we're going to try to do here is we're going to do a little bit of quantifying of the concept of vapor pressure and we're going to talk about its connection, vapor pressure's connection with uh, temperature. First thing we're going to do is take a look at some data. So up here I've created a small little table of data and it's for water as you can see and I have indicated here the vapor pressures for water at a variety of different temperatures. Now remember vapor pressure is an equilibrium value. We have to wait until the liquid water and the vapor water are in equilibrium with one another so there's no net change. Molecules are still exchanging between the two phases but again there's no net change. So what we can see is at zero degrees, water has a pretty darn low vapor pressure, about five torr. 25, it's about 24 torr. We actually saw that in a previous video when we talked about uh, measuring vapor pressures using barometers. 40 degrees here, it's about 55 torr. 90 degrees, it's 526. So one question I have to start with is, where are these numbers headed? Where are these temperatures headed? And where are these vapor pressures headed? If you've indicated, if you've thought to yourself, you know what, I think I know where they're headed. I think I know that if we had, let's say, 100 degrees here, I think I know what the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees is. Did you say, perhaps, that it's going to be 760? Hopefully you did. So this actually gets to an important definition that we have. Um, boiling points. You know what a boiling point is. It's when the liquid uh, readily goes from the liquid phase to the gas phase. But that's sort of the layman's term for boiling point. The real definition for boiling point, the nerd's definition for boiling point, is when that liquid's vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. Now we here in Hackensack, we are typically at 1 atm or 760 torr, 760 millimeters of mercury. So our water here in Hackensack, New Jersey, as we know, boils at 100 degrees. So that's really the rigorous definition of boiling point, the temperature at which a liquid's vapor pressure equals the atmospheric or surrounding pressure. Now there's another definition I want you to know about, and that is something called the normal boiling point, N-O-R-M-A-L, normal boiling point. That's the temperature at which a liquid's vapor pressure equals specifically 1 atm. So boiling points will change because the surrounding pressure will change. Normal boiling points don't change. The normal boiling point of water, regardless of where you are, is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. But the boiling point of water, that's going to vary. For us here in Hackensack, it's darn close to 100 degrees Celsius. But if you go to Denver, the mile high city, their boiling point for water is actually noticeably lower. I forget what the number is, but it's somewhere around like 93 or 94 degrees Celsius. Their water boils at a lower temperature because the surrounding pressure about a mile up into the, uh, the atmosphere is noticeably lower. So the boiling point's lower, okay? So think about this. If you cook spaghetti, in Denver. Will it take longer to cook your spaghetti or shorter to cook your spaghetti? So let's say here in Hackensack it takes about 10 minutes to boil your spaghetti to the, um, to the, uh, to the, to the way you like your spaghetti. How long is it going to take in Denver? Is it going to take more or less than 10 minutes? Think about that. All right, so anyways, let's come back to the data here. All right, I want to take a closer look at this data. If we were to graph this data, and we're talking about water here, so I'm going to put a, a blue line here on these axes. So I have vapor pressure versus temperature in Celsius. What's the shape of this curve going to look like? Well, hopefully you are picking up that it's curved, right? There's um, sort of a, an exponential uh, relationship going on here. And so eventually if we get to say this point right here, I'll tick it off, uh, that's not very good, but that point right there, let's say that that's 1 atm, that's 760 um, tor, okay, 760 tor or you know 1 atm. So then the point right 
here is my normal boiling point for water. Okay? Now, other liquids are going to have you know, similar shapes. You know, some liquids might have curves like this, and so their normal boiling point is something greater than 100 degrees. And then there are other liquids like ethanol. I'll, I'll do ethanol in black. Ethanol has a lower boiling point than water, right? Ethanol has a boiling point of about 75 degrees Celsius. Ethanol is the alcohol that would be in things like beer and, and wine. So it has a lower boiling point. But you see that all these curves, these pressure versus temperature curves, they're exactly that. They're curves. And in science, we're not big fans of curves when we graph things. Right? We'd like things to be straight lines because we know equations for straight lines. They're easier to work with. They're easier to make predictions with. So we're going to have to play around with the axes here. And it turns out, believe it or not, I just want to get this out of the way, get my data out of the way. It turns out that if you graph the natural log of the vapor pressures versus the reciprocal of temperature in Kelvin, you actually will get a straight line. You'll get a straight line, okay? Now, we've kind of seen straight lines with natural logs before. Where have we seen straight lines with respect to natural logs before? You think about that. Not only do we get a straight line here, which is kind of cool unto itself, but the slope of this line actually is something useful. It turns out that the slope of this line is the delta H for the phase change. So the heat of, if we're talking about liquid to gas, which enthalpy is this? Is this the enthalpy of fusion? Or is this the enthalpy of vaporization? It's the enthalpy of vaporization, right? So it turns out that this slope is the enthalpy of vaporization divided by the universal gas constant R, okay? And it's got a negative slope there, as you can quite clearly see. So I guess I'll put a, a negative sign in there just to make that emphatic. All right, so maybe it's not obvious that you'll get a straight line when you graph the natural log of vapor pressures versus the reciprocal of the absolute temperatures. But again, we've seen lines that straighten out when you have natural logs in them before. And we've also seen lines where the slope gives us some useful information, right? We've seen that. Uh, where this has been activation energy in our kinetics unit. So the slope of this line gives us some interesting worthwhile thermodynamic information, namely the enthalpy of vaporization for the liquid that we're talking about, in this case water. Do you remember the enthalpy of vaporization for water? I believe I showed it to you in the last video, right? It's about 40.7 kilojoules per mole. All right, so this is going to be pretty helpful. So if you can graph, if you can get a whole bunch of data, if you can get a whole bunch of vapor pressures at a whole bunch of different temperatures and graph those vapor pressures, the natural logs of those vapor pressures, versus the reciprocal of temperature in Kelvin of those vapor pressures, you can figure out for that liquid the enthalpy of vaporization. This is how science is done, right? This is how these values are actually obtained experimentally. A whole bunch of vapor pressures at a whole bunch of different temperatures. Now, let's play around with this a little bit more. Let's say we don't have an entire graph of enthalpy of vaporization data. Let's say we only have a certain subset of information. Now, it turns out that because of that straight line I have up there, what I've gotten so far, if I look at the straight line relationship, right, I have the natural log of the vapor pressure, and I'll just leave it as, uh, as the letter P for now, is equal to uh, my M value, which is delta H over R times my uh, x value, which is 1 over temperature, and the slope is negative, so I'm going to put a negative sign there, plus my y-intercept b. Now, it turns out that the y-intercept here, that's a b there. That doesn't look very good, but that's a b. The y-intercept in this case, um, as far as I know, doesn't really have any physical meaning, so we're going to kind of ignore that. Now, what if I play around with this data, right? What if I have one vapor pressure at one temperature and another vapor pressure at another temperature and I write the, this equation down twice so ln P1 equals delta H over R times 1 over T1 plus B 
uh, natural log P2 equals delta H over R times 1 over T2 plus B. So I write that equation twice, and then I take the difference between the two equations. I'm going to get a relationship whose shape should look darn familiar to us. I'm going to get something that's going to look like this. Whoops, let me get the pen. The natural log of, I'll write it P1 over P2, it doesn't matter what's on top and bottom, is equal to the delta H of vaporization divided by the gas constant R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Have we seen something that looks like that before? I think we have. I think we've seen this a couple of times now. We have seen an equation that looks like this with equilibrium constants here and the delta H of a reaction there. We've seen this with um, kinetics k's, with a rate constant k's here, and the activation energy there. So we've seen this relationship a few different times. Now, this uh, particular equation does have its own name. This is referred to as the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. I'll just abbreviate that, Clausius-Clapeyron equation. So we've seen Clausius-Clapeyron-like equations a number of times now. Um, so this is a pretty handy result. So if you know the vapor pressure of a liquid at one temperature and you know some other temperature you're going to, you can figure out what its vapor pressure will be if you also know the heat of vaporization. Or if you know the two P's and you know the two T's, you can figure out the vapor pressure. So you can see the kinds of questions that we're going to practice with this. All right. So. What was this video about? This video was about connecting the idea of vapor pressure to temperature, right? We know that if you increase the temperature, you're going to increase the vapor pressure. And we know that as you increase the temperature, we now know that you will inch closer and closer and closer to the atmospheric pressure. And then you'll be at the boiling point once the uh, vapor pressure of that liquid equals the surrounding vapor pressure, that liquid is now officially boiling. You now have the nerd's definition of boiling point. Okay, uh, in class we'll probably practice this clausius clapeyron equation a little bit, and we'll start to head into some things uh, called heating curves uh, in the next set of videos, which you've seen before, I believe, in physics class. All right, till next time, why don't we have uh, Queen take us out? Push it down on me. Push it down on me.